doing GovSimus develop, development. Um, I'm actually going to touch on a few PaaS things as well as SaaS things. Um, anyone who's not doing any PaaS or SaaS may find a lot of the stuff, uh, hopefully it'll at least be quirky, um, if anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present. I'm just going to jump into it. So it is going to jump from thing to thing. Uh, I've got half an hour to present. I might end up using that up a bit early and then have some questions. Um, let's have a look at this. So I, I'm not going to do background. I'm just going to jump into it. If you do have questions, please ask those questions into the chat. I'll try and read that as I go along. Um, so, okay, first thing is this presentation mode is not going to work, so I'm going to jump around. So key places I want to tell you about with GovCMS, um, the, the, and the, a lot of this stuff is like new people who come on, where do I go, what do I do? The key places that I think for GovCMS for a new, for a new project uh, GitLab is at projects.govcms, Lagoon is dashboard.govcms, and Freshdesk is govcms.support, so that's the help desk. But in addition to those places, there's also all the repositories on github.com, and then there's a couple of other URLs that um, I'm going to drop these here because if you might in two months' time think, Ah, you know, I heard I, I, there's logs somewhere, and you might go back to this presentation and look at some of these links throughout the thing. So even though I wouldn't recommend anyone going to Kibana because you really need to know how to use it to make anything of it, I'm going to leave some links here in my presentation. Um, so there are your key places if you find yourself on GovCMS. Um, so what, where are the best docs for GovCMS? Um, I personally think, having had a hand in this, that the best docs for GovCMS uh, at this URL. So what is this URL? This URL is actually a wiki for one of the GovCMS repositories. So this is the original GovCMS repository. It's it's now the GovCMS 7 distribution as opposed to the GovCMS 8 distribution. Um, but it happens to be where wiki documentation is kept for Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 versions of GovCMS. Um, the wiki actually breaks it down into a few things. It's, it's a good place to start um, in that it has the distribution is in chapter two, essentially. Um, some generalized things are, are around the around developing are in chapter one. And then some and then there's also things like finding resources page that tries to be a, like a who's who of links to all the different things in GovCMS because GovCMS does have a lot of repositories. There's a lot of resources that you might want to access. So just make sure that I'm not screwing up and I'm just going to check my, see if anyone's left me any comments. No, okay, everyone's happy, it seems. Um, yes, I'm presenting. Um, so that would be the main place that I would recommend anyone who's starting with um, GovCMS to go um, and to scan through all these pages and see. There's some really good, like, for example, uh, in terms of Googleable stuff, you might find that this troubleshooting thing um, just as just a hodgepodge of like lots of different things that might happen to you on GovCMS. So this is where I go, where I get a weird Docker things because I'm like, oh, I need to maybe log into the to the Docker thing on GitLab again because it it gives you might give you weird messages. So this is I'll often come back here and you know Google for things or search through these documents to see if I've done something silly. Um, the but there's a couple other places to be consider. There's the GovCMS training, and the problem with that is it's stale. Like, so it's like if you wanted someone to train someone in GovCMS on web forms or something like that, there's not, not really anything in there. So um, hopefully that's something it's got, it's in a Git repository. So hopefully that's going to come along at some point. Um, because there are some downsides to this wiki as well, like um, that I've, I've noticed having been involved in them. Um, the GitHub for wikis isn't ideal, so it would be really nice to see that as the central place at some point. At the moment, it's just got um, two training documents. Um, then there's Freshdesk, which is great if you're on Freshdesk. Uh, it's got a lot of duplication because it's like a walled garden, so there's a lot of duplication between things in the wiki and things on Freshdesk. Um, then there are some other wikis that are mostly being consolidated um, into that wiki that I just showed you. So. That's been a, that's a big thing you'll notice when you're talking to people about GovCMS is like the documentation is very difficult to negotiate. So hopefully that's just a really quick intro to the documentation for you. Um, connecting to other people, um, the places to go I would recommend for anyone who's starting would be the GovCMS Slack. So um, 
if you are looking for access to that, it's someone can invite you. So you can always jump in the Drupal Slack and ask someone about that. Um, then there's community.govsemester.gov.au. Uh, I'm not sure offhand. I, I think that's a self sign up, but I would say that they're the two best kind of developer e things, places to go um, with the GovCMS Slack like, probably being the best resource. There's lots of chatter about GovCMS. But um, we also, there's also a couple of other places that I would recommend for different reasons. Like if you really can't be bothered joining a million Slacks, um, you can just come into hash GovCMS in the Drupal Slack. Um, there's a few people in there. Uh, and there's also GovTeams. And if you've got a client who's only in GovTeams um, there or, you know, and you want to interact with some of the GovCMS people, there's a GovCMS team. They may, but that's like a really fringe thing. You're only going to be in there if you if you um, if there's a reason and someone adds you from the government essentially um but i would say that they're the main two places to connect as far as govcms goes um so uh this is where i'm going to just jump into a whole bunch of different things uh and i might even come back to this one i don't like the order of it um this one's like so I want to introduce you just to really briefly to the GovCMS dashboard um, because I want to do one of the questions that comes up when I'm working with people who are new to GovCMS is like, you know, what happened to my build? Did my build run? I have no idea if my if if it failed or if it succeeded. So I'm going to give you a really quick example of what a build looks like um, in GovCMS. So you're going to you'll you'll have been given access to that this dashboard, which is um, the Lagoon interface, um, and you're going to go to go to a project and the branch in the project and deployments, and then you're going to scroll to the bottom. So I'm just going to show you what a deployment looks like in GovCMS. Because um, it's it looks like it's useless in that there's too much information, and I've just scrolled for a long time. So we've got basically got a deployment here um, of a demo site. Um, and what I want to point out is that it's not, like most of it you don't care about, but I want to show you the bits that you would care about. So the easiest thing to do, I think, is to do a search of something that you know is going to have happened at some point, such as a drush command. So if I start searching for the right word, um, drush, I get a couple of hits in the document early on. You notice that there's build steps and things like that, but this is just highlighting the fact that it's right at the very bottom, which is what you really want to see when you're wondering what happened to your build, because at the very bottom of any, every GovCMS build, after all of the containers have been built and so forth, then it starts getting into the good stuff where it decides whether you've got a production environment and whether it should import your database or import config uh, and all those other things. And then if there's going to be an error in your build like there is in, in this one that I've pulled up, then you'll be able to see that here. And that's right at the very bottom of your last deployment on GovCMS. Um, so um, I just, so this is basically, basically this is just a, a demo site and you've got your deployments here on the left and you're going to go into the last deployment and then you're going to scroll all the way to the bottom to find that. Um, okay, so that's a common one, I see. Um, what So I've got here, what happened to my build? So you're going to go into your thing, you're going to see your deployment, scroll all the way down to the very bottom. Um, and it does, like I said, it does help. Search of something like Drush, that helps highlight where in that log you're going to find things. Um, something I wanted to pick up while I'm on that note is that Something that's up and coming, and this is probably more for past users, is that Lagoon CLI. And I'm sort of excited about this because it's going to make it possible to not have to do what I just did in terms of going into the, the deployment. Um, uh, so this is going to be one of those ones that if you have to do this, you might want to refer back to this because I worked it out this afternoon. But basically, I've got a CLI. I've configured that to point to the GovCMS Lagoon using this command here. And then once I've done that, I can start running commands that people on Pantheon and Platform will be more familiar with, where you can start running commands against an environment in order to, in order to see some results. And I'll just check that example out. Oops, capsule. So um, they're running deployment against a project and then a branch that's not specific, and there we go. Um, now, I don't use this CLI, but I just wanted to flag that because it's coming through, and particularly because at the moment it's not documented how to connect. So maybe this is this is going to be something we see more of in the future, where we can connect to Lagoon, we can start running commands against Lagoon. Um, 
for our projects and that would be cool and that's all I'm going to say about that. Now I want to talk about code bases. Uh, am I in the right spot? Yes. I want to talk about the difference between PAS and SAS. So let's talk first about um, doing a SAS project. Um, and the question is if you've got a project whether you, that you're not quite sure whether it's going to be PAS or SAS, um, what, is it, what does it look like, the difference between those two things? I'm going to start off by talking about what it might look like to have a SAS site and then convert that into a PAS site. Um, so essentially, it's, essentially the difference between PAS and SAS is these two locations in your code base. Um, so I've got on the left, I've got a repository that is a SAS site, and on the right, I have a repository that's a PAS site. If all things are the same between those two repositories in that they're both just the GovCMS profile, then the, uh, then the really the only thing that's custom to those projects is the config directory and the themes directory in that you would be able to convert a site from a SAS site to a PAS site by simply moving those folders or copying those folders from one site to another um, with caveats around whether you're using config for your deployment and so forth. Um, but I think this is a really good one because I think there's like a little bit of hang up about, okay, um, I'm doing this, I'm doing, I've got to build a SAS site, but we don't know when we're going on the platform. It could be another six months. Um, you might have some really, like a really good build process and so forth. And um, it's really good to understand what it is that is being expected um, of you for your PAS, for your SAS site. Um, so I, felt, I find like these slides are a little bit out of order from where I want to go. So I want to talk, I want to just skip those two couple of slides and jump to this one. So what I want to talk about is something that's dear to my heart, which is if you're not on the platform yet, but you've got a SAS project in your pipeline, what's the best way to start developing that? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pitch to you that the best way to develop that is to use one of the GovCMS scaffolds called the scaffold PAS which might seem counterintuitive. Um, if we go back to the, this image before, though, you'll see that all we really need to do to develop a site is to maintain this compatibility with a SAS site, which is just our custom themes and our config directory. Um, and generally speaking, as long as all the dependencies for our themes and the configs are being met um, in our PAS site and not, not gone up past that, it's going to be compatible with a SAS site. So, um, so why would you, so I'll bring up the GovCMS scaffold PAS. Um, so it's just to differentiate what this is from a few other things, there's, there are a few scaffolds that GovCMS has. There's, there's the scaffold that um, allows you to build a new SAS site. And then, there's, um, and then there's this scaffold that allows you to do a new PAS site. There's also a GovCMS, I think it's the direct the URL is, have some as project or create project or something like that. Um, it's that's used a lot less. Um, this is the one that I this is my go to scaffold, and I want to explain to you why. So, say if I have a SAS site, I will start the project using that scaffold, and these are the benefits of it. Um, so, well, the, these are the risks of actually to start with. So, so the thing is, if you're going to use if you're going to build a site not using SAS and you're going to use it with build with a, SAS, uh, another scaffold, you have to be, remember to keep these things correct. You have to be really mindful that you're not going to add modules that aren't in SAS. You're not going to add libraries um, that aren't in SAS because you wouldn't be able to add them to SAS later. You're not going to be adding custom code. You're not going to be um, overriding things in your settings.php. Um, you're not going to be adding patches and um, and so forth. So, so if we look at the um, the benefits of the past scaffold, it's the first benefit is that the PAS scaffold is actually completely compatible with the SAS with the SAS site uh, out of the box. Um, so if you are if you're running if you if you think you've got a SAS site in your pipeline, um, you can basically run a more traditional Drupal composer build uh, and retain the benefits of of that prior to actually migrating that into a SAS scaffold. Um, and any customizations that you might do in the meantime, it, it, it helps you to do them in a way that keeps them completely separate so that it's very easy to do your conversion to a SAS site later. Um, and like I said, it's ready to go for PAS or SAS, whoops, it's ready to go for PAS or SAS or any other um, 
ultimate hosting platform. Um, so, for example, one thing that you can do in your past scaffold is uh, and something that happened to me was there was a patch, an upstream patch on GovCMS, which I needed, uh, I wanted in a SaaS site. Um, and, and that patch was, was approved for GovCMS, but it hadn't gone into GovCMS yet. So running the SaaS scaffold, there was a lot more mucking around in terms of having that patch. Um, but with the PaaS scaffold, I'm able to put that, that patch into, this, into a custom patches file. And when I build that scaffold, it uses that patch. Um, so that's instead of being in the composer JSON file, so I want to keep my composer JSON file kind of generic and not, not change it, and that allows me to put all my patches in that separate file. Um, the, what I have to be mindful of for when my site transfers into a SAS site is I want to be able to run that. Uh, I need, the site needs to be able to run without that patch. If there's any risk that that patch is not going to be there and ready once I deploy to the GovCMS platform, then that's, that's going to be a problem. Um, and so I want to make sure that patch is being committed upstream. Um, in some cases, but in some cases, your patch might be a patch to just help with your editing process. Um, and in which case, it doesn't. It, it's actually completely um, unnecessary to have that patch committed upstream. You're just having that patch for convenience, so that certain things um, work in the UI um, in the short term. Um, so uh, another example of that is say if you wanted to chuck in a bunch of development modules that you're not going to be using in the production site, but in the short term, they give you a lot more control. Um, the example might be you're doing a lot of work with menus, so you throw in the big menu module. You know that later you're going to remove that module. It's not actually going to impact um, the site when it's the SAS site. So uh, the PaaS scaffold lets you put all those modules in a composer.json file. Um, and you can verify all this against the scaffold itself. Uh, if you go to the scaffold, you see there's a custom directory uh, and you can check out the composer JSON file in that custom directory where you can where you can add additional modules. Um, so yeah, so it just allows you to define additional modules in, the, in a composer JSON file. Um, so and for SAS compatibility, you're saying to yourself, well, can I run that my site without that module? Um, and obviously, once you're ready to move your site over, you need to be a, potentially exporting all of your config without the module, which means uninstalling the module, exporting your config and then copying the config file into your SAS repository once it's been provisioned for you. Um, so another benefit of that is um, one thing that I find frustrating with the, with, the, with the Ahoy commands is they don't always match the, the common workflows that we do as a, as a team. So the, the CAS scaffold has the ability to customize a, a, an Ahoy YAML. So you can just keep all of your custom Ahoy commands all in a separate file. You're not touching the the, the GovCMS ones that sit in that Ahoy YAML. Um, so you can set up your own. No, then the only the only risk with your SAS site is loss of convenience. Um, there's the ability as well, just again, just to have a separate project settings file where you can put all your settings that you want to override. And again, you're keeping that completely separate from the past scaffold. And the beautiful thing about keeping all these files separate is later down the track, if your site ends up being a past site, um, you're ready for both. You don't have to, you're not really limiting yourself one way or the other. You can just simply go, turns out that it's this PaaS site, uh, got mogged, whatever, you're ready to go, you're ready to push it um, one way or the other. Um, and so probably the biggest thing to remember when you are um, you, like doing a PaaS site, then you might want to be using a separate development um, toolkit. So personally, I well, use a lot of Lando myself. So um, if I'm doing development, GovCMS development locally, I'm using Lando locally. And, but I have to be mindful of the fact that if I'm doing solar, then my Lando solar needs, you know, it wants to match the GovCMS solar at least, you know, pretty closely. Um, otherwise, you're, you know, you've basically you're taking that on yourself. Um, the more your, your development environment differs from GovCMS. But in my experience, all of the development tools that people use for Drupal are all, um, they, none of those result in a website that's incompatible with GovCMS. Um, so, so that's, I tell people to, to consider doing that. Um, okay, so that is probably a big chunk of things. I've got a few other things, or a few other tips and things that I want to start, um, throw at you. Uh, I want to throw at you that, yes, you can use the GovCMS UI, UI, UI kit starter theme if you'd like to. 
but um, you don't have to. Uh, and, and don't use it as a base theme. So if you read the GovCMS8 UI Kit Starter Info YAML, it says you should use it, you should copy it to your project. And yes, you can use it as a base theme in your project, but don't use the base, use the base theme in the profile because the problem is that when changes to that base theme happen, uh, it's very often that that causes regressions in your site because it affects your the theme that depends on that base theme. So. Um, so a big thing I say to people um, is, you know, really consider your options when you're starting a theme. For example, I, I will always use uh, a stable in, in core as my base theme, There's, and I find that that has a lot less regressions um, to, to do that. Like it's just Drupal core out of the box and, and it can do it the way, the way I want to do it. Um, so that's something that people often start on your GovCMS SAS site and they straight out of, out of the blocks they're using the starter kit and they're like deciding should i rename everything is it, it's it's a very complex thing to be working with if you don't need to um it's great if you're doing the vanilla pro inst um, content model that the profile comes with because a lot of things will be integrated out of the box it just really depends on your project um and similar to that i really tell people to consider using a setting up right at the very start a custom admin theme um, because what we tend to do is when there's like a glitch in the UI for editors, we just want to throw a bit of CSS in there. Um, we commonly wrap um, the adminimal theme in a custom theme um, wrapper. And it just means we can just chuck, yeah, chuck in a few little things like preprocessors and stuff for um, like paragraphs, previews and things for ad, uh, editors. Um, and then uh, um, it doesn't really matter what you're using as a base theme. Um, you can put your, a different admin theme from Drupal.org if you want. Um, we find admin works really well with GovCMS. Um, and just so you know, uh, the, the, the new Drupal core admin theme, Claro, is not really ready to be used with GovCMS. There's just sort of too much going on uh, there and it's, it's sort of not stable enough at this point. Um, so just on the right, I've just got an example of what your um, admin info theme might look like and using admin or theme as a base theme. Um, find that works really well. And then I just want to talk about the content model for the profile. So um, the like GovZimus sites, the big in, the in theory part of it is that you like if they're all brochureware sites because, you know, you can do a lot with what's out of the box um, with the content types and things like that. And they're they're sort of ready to go, and the upstream they're being there's being improved. Um, but what I see go wrong is when people are getting a build that's differing from that, and and they're not using any of the content types out of the box with GovCMS. So they're getting a lot of entity types and things like that in their configuration um, that may never get used. So I really it's I, so I want to say it's not a crime to remove stuff like you know taxonomy types and content types from GovCMS. Um, it, it actually the the balance of the equation is that you'll have potentially less issues and uh, you know you'll never get that situation where developers you ask them why they created a new image style uh, when there were three image styles they could have used and they say oh, I wasn't sure what they were being used for and it turns out they weren't even being used so um, so it's something I do recommend a GovCMS tip I do recommend is consider um, consolidating your entity types um, how might you do that? It's um, you can just delete stuff that you know you're not going to use. It's, you can always recreate them, not a problem. Um, you might want to uninstall heavy UI modules like panels if you're not going to use them because they do add a, they do add a lot of steps of when you're debugging a site to go how is this being presented? Is it display split? Is it panels? Is it custom preprocessor? So just try and you have the things you're going to use installed if possible. Now I will say it's not easy to do that. Um, something that will, um, because there's dependencies that can be quite difficult to unpick with the, get the profile. Um, something we sometimes do is we install the minimal profile um, to a GovCMS and then um, change it so that it's the GovCMS profile so that we do get um, some of the core GovCMS profile stuff. Um, but there's a, it's a little bit um, tricky to, there's a couple of little tricks to it. Um, but just saying that that works quite well as well. Um, GovCMS as a platform, the SAS side as a platform, uh, SAS platform does allow you to build very simple uh, Drupal sites. They don't have to have a lot of content types. They can have one content type and they can have a couple of displays. Uh, uh, and 
you can do that all with what's in um, Drupal core out of the box and just use your own very simple, um, you know, very simple theme. So don't, so don't forget that GovCMS is something on top of Drupal. Don't forget that it's Drupal underneath um, that is much simpler and much, you know, much more robust and, um, and free of regressions. Um, so I think that time-wise that's pretty good. That's a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of things that you might want to consider um, potentially. Hopefully didn't bore anyone. Uh, a few other things I just want to say. A couple of modules in Drupal Core that you might not know are there. Um, you know, schedule transitions went in recently. That's been that's been fantastic. Entity reference displays is a nice little one that lets people control how their entity references are being output from the editor UI. Um, you can now replace files in GovCMS, yay. That's something that people have been wanting for a long time. Uh, and another weird one is the context module, which people don't realize is there because you don't turn on the context unless you've turned on the context UI module. Um, but that's really great for these tiny little fixes you might want to do, like setting active menus and adding blocks. And if you've got a couple of different block layouts and you're, you think your block UI is going to be a bit um, full on, context module can work really well for that. So it's just that's my final tip, and that's about me half an hour.